Last week, we began looking at the book of Nehemiah. Uh, with the hopes of discovering, for some of us, how we can experience renewal and refreshment in our lives. In our lives personally and also in our lives uh, as a church, maybe as a community, maybe even as a business. Whatever area of your life you need uh, renewal and refreshment, I think Nehemiah has something to say to you about that. We kind of got an intro last week. Nehemiah was a slave in Babylon. Uh, he had risen to a place of prominence. He was the cupbearer to the king. Uh, and Nehemiah heard word, came to him, that the walls of Jerusalem were still in rubbles. And we saw last week that Nehemiah was heartbroken that the walls around Jerusalem were still in rubbles. He was heartbroken because it meant that the Jewish people were defenseless. He was more heartbroken because the walls around Jerusalem symbolized the spiritual state of the Jewish people. And, and Nehemiah is torn, he's weeping. But Nehemiah, what we saw last week, what was the first thing that Nehemiah does? That's right. I mean, Nehemiah is heartbroken. He's torn. He's, he feels a passion about this. Nehemiah spends four months praying and fasting, lining up his heart with God's heart and, and his plans with God's plans. He spends that time preparing so that when God provides the opportunity, Nehemiah is going to be ready to work within God's will and in God's time. And so we see in the scripture that Nehemiah says that when it was time for action, it was because the gracious hand of the Lord was upon him that he was granted success because he waited on God's time. We made a commitment last week, those of us who are here in worship, and if you weren't here in worship and you're on our mailing list, you got a letter this week saying that we as a church have committed to a time of prayer uh, for this month of July. Uh, we're just praying as one body over specific topics each day that God would grant us unity, that God would grant us vision, that God would bless our church, and that we would take this time to align our ideas and our vision, our plans with what God wants for each one of us. So that's what we've been doing. Uh, last week as we read the story of Nehemiah, uh, it was all basically about Nehemiah. But this week we come to the reality that what God wants Nehemiah to do is too much for one person to do. I mean, the, the calling and the task that God has for him is going to take the whole people of God coming together. Now listen, that's good because all the great things of God take more than one person. They take a community of people working together. And, and so Nehemiah needs all of the people to come together to accomplish this task. The problem is, is that the Jewish people are as divided as our Congress is in Washington, D.C. Right? They were not getting along. Uh, they were robbing from each other. Uh, the rich and the poor were fighting. The nobles and the, the ranked people were fighting. Everybody was fighting with one another. And there was no sense of cooperation between any of the people. And there was certainly not a willingness of any of the people to come and to work together on basically anything at all. So Nehemiah's problem was, how do you get a people who are divided and fighting to come together to do something great for God? It's not a bad question, is it? In fact, we could say it's a pretty contemporary, modern question. How do we get a people who are different, who have their own issues and their own ideas and their own problems to come together to do something great for the kingdom of God? You might be asking, how do I get my family to come together to do something great for the kingdom of God? How do I get my business to come together so that we do something great for the kingdom of God? I think as we read through Nehemiah, we're going to see some, uh, some principles that apply to all of those areas. Uh, this morning I'm in Nehemiah chapter 2. I'm going to begin in verse 11. Nehemiah says this, I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few men. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. By night I went out through the valley gate toward the jackal well and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem which had been broken down and its gates which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on toward the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mount to get through. So I went up the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God upon me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. Now listen, 
Nehemiah sums it up really, really simply. So they said, let's get going. But when, he, when they all come together and say, let's get going and begin this good work, that's a miracle. Because this divided, fighting, spiritually dry people have come together to do this great work of God. And they were so far from that before this moment. Nehemiah brought them together by getting them to focus on one thing. He brought them together because they were focused on a single purpose. If I asked you today to describe your life with one word, I said, just give me one word to describe your life. Just kind of think in your mind, what would that one word be? I know what some people would say. Busy. How many of you are thinking busy? Some people are thinking overcrowded, uh, hectic. Uh, maybe somebody's thinking good. All right, that, that'd be good. But how many people would say this? Your one word is focused. If I had to describe my life, how many say it would be focused? It'd be cool to say it though, wouldn't it? My life is focused. I know why I'm here. I know I'm supposed to be doing. A focused life is the life that Jesus calls his disciples to live. In fact, when Jesus' disciples were worrying about all sorts of things, Jesus told the disciples, he said, guys, you're worrying about all sorts of things. You don't have to worry about all those things. Jesus said, listen, you only have to worry about one thing, right? He said, there's just one thing. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things that you're worrying about are going to be taken care of. Jesus wanted his disciples to live a focused life. And Nehemiah knew the power of a focused life. Focused lives are powerful. When people come together, a focused people come together, transformation takes place. How many of you guys played with magnifying glass when you were kids? Especially guys. If you were a guy, what did you do with a magnifying glass? You lit things on fire. Somebody said burn dance. All right. All right. You did stuff like that. You didn't go around looking things to see if they were bigger. If you're, especially if you're, you know what you did? You burned stuff with it. All right, kids, don't do that. That's dangerous. It hadn't rained in forever. Don't take, uh, you know, confiscate all the magnifying glasses from your children now. You know what happens? The light goes through that magnifying glass and becomes focused. And that focused light really becomes powerful. Focused lives are powerful. A focused people become transformational in their community. And Nehemiah knew the power of a people who were focused. And so Nehemiah helped the people to focus on one thing. Verse 17, he says to them, You see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. Now listen, the, the people of Jerusalem had settled in to life. Uh, the people of Jerusalem had become accustomed to living in disgrace. Listen, we said the very first week I was here that life doesn't have to be good for you to get comfortable in it. You know people who are comfortable in ungodly situations. That's not good. They had become uncomfortable in an ungodly situation. They had become accustomed to living in disgrace. But Nehemiah says, this is not acceptable for God's people to live in disgrace. Because Nehemiah understood who the Jewish people were called to be. They were not ordinary people. They were the people called by God to signify and to symbolize to the rest of the world the reality of a one God of a God who is all-powerful and all-loving. And they had become a mockery to the rest of the world. And Nehemiah says, it is not acceptable for God's people to live in disgrace. It's not acceptable. And Nehemiah gets him to focus not simply on rebuilding the wall, but it's about rebuilding the glory of God. They were called to reflect the glory of God and to do anything else was not acceptable for them. Nehemiah got them to focus on something beyond themselves. He called them to live for something greater than their own life. He called them to look beyond their own problems to, to see the life that God wanted to give to them. He called them to focus on God's glory. Listen, you know what happens when we focus on ourselves in community? Here's what happened. God created us to live in community. When people created to live in community focus on themselves, the result is division, uh, is disunity, 
it is the death of relationship, the death of joy, and the death of peace. When a people created for community focus on themselves, that's what they experience. James chapter 4, Now I love the book of James because, man, James is so practical. James chapter 4 says this, beginning in verse 1. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. Listen, James says, where do, where do the sor- what's the source of our quarreling and fighting? I want something and don't get it. He says, that's where it comes from. When life becomes about me, the result is quarreling and fighting and divisiveness, and that's what was happening to Nehemiah's people. They were quarreling and they were fighting and they were divided and they were not willing to come together to accomplish the purposes which God had for them. That's what happens when we focus on ourselves. It's fun to come to come to worship. I love worship. When we come to worship, you know, we're all singing, we're all singing songs that's all about you, God. I mean, God, my life is yours, and God, I love you, and God, everything I have is yours, and God, it's not about me, it's all about you. But I want to tell you, some of us are really singing a different song. And the CD that a lot of us would like to buy is this one I want to show you right here. Watch this. Grace Community presents a new worship album. It's all about me. For just three easy payments of $19.95, all of these favorites can be yours. Sign up today. In defense of Chad, let me tell y'all, he did not want to make that. All right? I had to push him a little bit. Yeah, but the truth is, and we sing it's all about you, God, on Sunday. But the truth is, for a lot of us, it's really, it's all about me. And you know, one of the ways that we know that even on Sundays is because, now not y'all, because y'all are good folks, but at some of these other churches around here. <laughs> yeah, you know what happens at some of these places? People come to worship. And then they go out to eat at La Fiesta or somewhere right around here. And they, they have this conversation around the lunch table that sounds something like this. What do you think about worship today? I didn't really like the music today. I mean, why did they choose those songs? I mean, I didn't really like, you know, the way they sang the songs. And, and then people say, well, what do you think about this? Sorry, I didn't really like it that much. You know, it wasn't funny enough or it wasn't this enough. It was too short. It was too long. It's this or that. And we sit around the lunch table and we debate whether or not we liked worship as if worship was about us. I mean, we take this time, this moment, uh, when we come together as the body of Christ, when we come together just to, to worship God and to love God and say, God, it's all about you, but then we evaluate this time based on whether it did anything for me, as if it's all about me. Listen, in communities where it's all about me, what we experience is division. Uh, what we experience is disunity. Is a people who come complacent uh, in life, a people who focus on their own problems and who do not come together to do the great things that God has called us to do. Nehemiah shows us a different way. Nehemiah has the people focusing on something beyond themselves. And Nehemiah knew that the people would never come together unless they had a purpose that was greater than their problems. See, these people had problems. I mean, they were still suffering from a land that had been destroyed by the Babylonians. Uh, Many of their loved ones were still uh, captive in a foreign land. They were experiencing the unfairness of this life that that many of us experience from time to time. And and how could they focus on all, on the rebuilding of the wall when they had so many problems? Nehemiah had to give them a purpose that was greater than their problems. And when Nehemiah got them to focus beyond themselves, beyond their own problems, to realize it was not about them. They came together to do something great for the kingdom of God. We see this again and again in the Scripture. The Apostle Paul was great about this. I mean, the Apostle Paul went throughout carrying the message of Christ, but Paul formed communities of people 
Paul's ministry was not about Paul. It was about forming communities of people who transformed their community and transformed their world. And the communities that Paul formed had great power and and just turned the world upside down through their ministry. And how that happened is because Paul was able to help them focus beyond themselves. We see that in his own life. One of my favorite stories uh, from Paul comes from Acts chapter 16. Paul is... uh, uh, Paul is doing ministry, and he's being followed around by this, this, this uh, girl who uh, uh, has a demon in her. And Paul cast out this demon that's inside this girl. And when he cast out this demon inside this girl, uh, the owner of the girl, uh, the slave girl, begins to lose money. Uh, so see, people rarely get upset till you start messing with their pocketbook. But Paul's now messed with their pocketbook. All right, and so now they're all mad and angry. And, and listen to what happens here. Uh, Acts chapter 16, beginning verse 22. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Now listen, that's an incredible story. Paul and Silas are just doing what God's called them to do. And because he, uh, God uses him to throw this demon out of this girl, he ends up beaten, flogged, and thrown into the inner cell of the prison. Being, listen, being in prison in that day was a bad deal all around. Being in the inner cell was the worst deal. Because in the inner cell, you didn't have any windows, you didn't have any airflow. He was inside, so he didn't have access to the outside. And this was not a nice place. This was a dank, nasty, urine-filled, smelling, gross place with rats crawling all over the floor. And Paul could have focused on his wounds. Paul could have focused on how unfair life is because he was doing the right thing and now he's been punished and there he is in jail. He could have focused on the rats that were nibbling on his feet. He could have focused on all those things, but instead, what does he do? He simply begins to praise God. He begins to praise God because in every situation, Paul realized it wasn't about him. You read through his letters and you see this. In every situation that he found himself, he asked this question. How do I bring God glory in this situation? It wasn't about him. It was about the glory of God. And somehow Paul transferred that, uh, that principle to the people that he ministered to and the communities that were formed so they realized it wasn't about them. It was about the glory of God. And when the people of God come together and take themselves out of the center and put God in the center and put God as the focus, God uses those people in tremendous ways throughout history. Not just in the Bible. We see it happening again and again and again. When people put the glory of God first, God works in amazing ways. Some of you may know that John Wesley was the founder of the Methodist Church, what would become the Methodist Church. And uh, John Wesley uh, was an Anglican priest during a time when the, when the Church of England was absolutely dead spiritually. Um, and, and John Wesley simply said this is not acceptable. And he had, a, he had a single focus to spread scriptural holiness throughout the land. And, and Wesley reminded people uh, of the glory of God. And, and some of the genius of Wesley can be found in this prayer that Wesley wanted his people to pray at their New Year's services. And, and uh, Wesley wanted people to get together on the New Year's Day. And, and uh, this was the prayer that he wanted them to say. I am no longer my own but thine. Put me to what thou wilt. Rank me with whom thou wilt. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed for thee or laid aside for thee. Exalted for thee or brought low for thee. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thou art mine and I am thine. So be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. The genius of the Methodist revival can be found in these words. Lord, put me to what you will. Rank me with whom you will. Put me to doing or put me to suffering. Whatever it is for your glory, God, 
let that be what you do with me. Let me be employed for you or get me out of the way so somebody else can do what you want to do. Whichever is for your glory, God, this is what I desire. Lord, let me be exalted for thee or brought low for thee. Whichever is best for your glory, let that happen in my life. Lord, let me be full or let me be empty. Whichever is best for your glory, God, let that be in my life. Lord, let me have all things or let me have nothing. Neither means anything to me at all except for your glory. And there were people in the 18th century who began to pray this prayer. And as they prayed this prayer, a divided, spiritually dry, desperate people came together in the most powerful way, and they changed the world. It happens every time. When the people of God gather together and become a focused people, not on themselves, but on the glory of God, God begins to work in tremendous ways. What God is calling us to do in this place is not a task uh, that can be accomplished by one person alone. It's not a task that can be accomplished by a few. What God is calling us to do in this place is something that will require all of us working together. All of us becoming focused upon a single purpose, seeking the kingdom of God. And when we do that, when we do that, we're going to see a unity of spirit uh, more than we've ever known before. Uh, we're going to see God work in ways in which we've never seen before. It happens every time. God is calling us at this moment, at this time, to come together. And we'll do that by simply focusing together on one thing. It's not me. It's not about me. And it's not about you. It's about his glory. And so I'm going to invite you today uh, to stand with me. If you will, stand up. If you're right with me today, I'm going to invite us as a congregation to pray uh, this prayer. Uh, I just invite you as we pray this, to let this be our prayer to God, that we're, God, we're here together. Uh, we want to be the people that God has called us to be, joined together around a single purpose, to be used by God to bring him glory in this generation, at this time, in this place. When we pray this prayer, uh, and, and we pray this prayer from our heart, listen, God is preparing uh, to pour out his grace and his power upon this people. Pray with me. I am no longer my own but thine. Put me to what thou wilt. Rank me with whom thou wilt. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed for thee or laid aside for thee. Exalted for thee or brought low for thee. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. And now, O oh glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thou art mine and I am thine. So be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. Y'all remain standing as I pray.